Hello, listeners. Before we start this episode, I have something a little bit interesting to share with you all right now. As part of this show, I get the chance to investigate all kinds of cool stories from the past. But we are now starting to try and branch out to stories that are occurring right now. If you have a paranormal tale, a UFO experience, or just have something weird that you want investigated, please reach out to the show. Myself, along with a group of other very smart, like-minded people who like to apply science and good investigative skills to weird cases, are looking to start actually investigating these things, documenting them on video, and submitting reports out there for you, the listeners, to read. So please, again, if you have a cool story, an idea, an encounter with a UFO or a ghost, you know, a haunted place, whatever. Shoot us an email at themadscientistpodcast at gmail.com. Thank you so much, and let's get on with the show. Hello, listeners, and welcome to the Mad Scientist Podcast. This week, we'll be talking about a topic that we're always asked about, but which is seriously so complicated and huge that it could be a whole series of podcasts on its own. I am, of course, talking about satanic panics or more particularly the satanic ritual abuse scandal that terrified parents and children and lined the pockets of journalists looking to play up the scandal in the mid-80s to early 90s. This episode will be something of a primer on the subject, giving the general background before we delve into further details on more specific cases in upcoming episodes. However, at the end, we will dig deep-ish into the episode of The Kellers. We like to say that the satanic panic was an odd relic of the 1980s and 90s, and that this sort of thing couldn't possibly happen in the more rational modern world. We also like to say that witch crazes and false prosecutions based on the he said she said evidence of false memory, childhood susceptibility to coercion, and forced confession would never happen again either. Has the drive towards mass panic really gone away, or has the conspiracy world simply morphed these ideas and instincts into a larger whole? one which takes lack of evidence as evidence of wrongdoing, and which finds encroaching Satanism in their everyday lives. Could a mass panic happen again, this time fueled further with the power of the internet and a lure of informational safe spaces that cloud our judgment of the other side and demonize those who disagree with us as the other? Or, perhaps more scarily, did the satanic panic ever really die down in the first place? Or has it continued to smolder in the deepest, darkest parts of the internet, is Hillary Clinton secretly keeping child sex slaves in the basement of a pizzeria in Washington, D.C.? We won't find out, and that's the biggest proof of all in this week's episode. Welcome to the Mad Scientist Podcast. Today's episode, Satanic Panic. I want to start this episode with a quote from the book Folk Devils and Moral Panics by Stanley Cohen. Quote, Societies appear to be subject, every now and then, to periods of moral panic. A condition, episode, person, or group of person emerges to become defined as a threat to societal values and interests. Its nature is presented in a stylized and stereotypical fashion by the mass media. The moral barricades are manned by editors, bishops, politicians, and other right-thinking people. Socially accredited experts pronounce their diagnoses and solutions. Ways of coping are evolved or, more often, resorted to. The condition then disappears, submerges or deteriorates, and becomes more visible. Sometimes the object of the panic is quite novel, and at other times it is something which has been in existence long enough, but suddenly appears in the limelight. Sometimes the panic passes by and is forgotten except in folklore and collective memory. At other times, it is more serious and long-lasting repercussions, and might produce such changes as those in legal and social policy, or even in the way the society conceives itself. End quote. For those listeners, and podcast hosts with silky smooth voices, too young to clearly remember the satanic panic. This was a cultural event in the United States, and eventually the entire English-speaking world. Starting out in 1980, Gaining steam with books, documentaries, scientific papers, repeated lawsuits, criminal trials, exposés, and a smattering of convictions, and only slowed down in the late 90s. The general theory was that hidden amongst the everyday lives of ordinary citizens, in the towns and cities of America, existed groups of people whose main goal was the capture, conversion, and sexual exploitation of children. 
But these people were not simply the run-of-the-mill predators so horrifically commonplace in the world of the 1970s and 80s. Although, to say that this brand of predation has gone away is a great inaccuracy and injustice. These people were utilizing Satanism, indoctrinating children into this lifestyle and forcing them to recant their faith in Jesus Christ, perform deranged sexual magic, blasphemies, zoophilia, scatophilia, creating and distributing child pornography, and eventually selling the children into sexual slavery, murdering them, or sending them out into the world as if nothing out of the ordinary had ever happened to them. The locus for these crimes was reporting of sexual abuse at preschools and daycare centers, with children seeming to suggest that horrible things had been done to them, and that this was an organized and ongoing effort, with satanic or ritualistic style overtones. There were organizations dedicated to finding the source of these abuses, lecturers and psychologists who specialized in the treatment of victims, finding of suspected cases, and the eventual prosecution of the individuals involved, and just an overwhelming sense among some that not only was this a very real phenomenon, but that it was likely happening all around them. There was just one problem with this story. None of it was ever really proven, with no evidence of satanic-style cults, ritualistic abuse, or even illegal activities of any kind ongoing at the vast majority of places where these panics became the most focused. From a mix of leading interview questions and coercive techniques on the children involved, hypnotherapy to recall repressed memories of adults who were supposedly abused as children, a number of social and cultural events leading up to this period of time, and sensationalist media coverage, these cases would explode. And, thanks to overzealous prosecution and public outcry, a number of these accusations would blossom into long, costly trials that damaged the vast majority of those involved. Like I said in the intro, this period of time is so detailed and frankly fascinating that we could do an entire series on individual cases and aspects of the satanic panic. And if this episode is received warmly, then maybe we'll do just that. But before we get into the nitty gritty of the particular case we're going to look at here, we need to talk about the cultural situation in which these events occurred. The Satanic Panic really picked up steam in the 80s and only really stopped towards the year 2000. And their beginnings come straight from the 70s and that mindset of people that came from the 70s in my opinion. Now, the 70s were a very interesting time in American history at least, both because of the beginnings of mass media, the absolutely brutal images we received from Vietnam, the leftovers of the psychedelic drug use and free love era of the 60s, and just kind of the coagulation of a whole bunch of social tensions and ideas and, you know, like the cultural soup of the 70s was extremely fascinating. I've seen some characterize this period as one of cynicism, and in many ways the 70s are where the conspiracy theory culture of the modern day was really born. And an era where our worst opinions of government and corporations were in many ways proven to be correct. We had the JFK assassination happen not that long ago. We had Watergate. We had the continuation of racial tensions, even after the civil rights movement. We had the creation of seedy red light districts all over the cities of the world. We had just a huge amount of political corruption, corruption at local police forces. And we also had the beginnings of a major drug epidemic. And on top of that all, we had disco. We would also find out that in many of our communities, there existed monsters, real monsters, men driven by dark sexual urges and violent fantasies to commit crimes so shocking that we still talk about them today. Serial killers were an almost unthinkably common occurrence in the 70s, with some of the biggest names amongst those perpetrators coming to us from this decade, preying on runaways and drug addicts. In fact, looking at some statistics put together by Dr. Mike Amit at Radford University, the number of serial killers who made their first kill in a particular decade absolutely exploded in the 60s until the 2000s. With 72 serial killers in the 50s, 217 in the 60s, 605 in the 70s, 768 in the 80s, 669 in the 90s, and then decreasing to 317 in the 2000s and 117 in the 2010s. 
and in many ways the loose control on and protection of children led to the criminals of later decades. With sexual abuse, domestic abuse, childhood drug and alcohol abuse, and children becoming runaways, another much more common occurrence than they were in later decades. There's also some interesting ideas to think that environmental pollution may have played some part. I've seen some studies that say that potentially lead poisoning may have led, or rather, that lead poisoning may lead to more violent actions by a person. Anytime we try to subscribe a single chemical root or chemical cause to something as complex as violence, it's a little fishy to me, but it's an interesting theory nonetheless. So okay, the 70s weren't a great time necessarily to be a kid, but it isn't as if these problems didn't continue into later decades. According to the Duke University Childhood Well-Being Index, a downward trend in the overall well-being of children, measured as a number of risk factors and crimes committed against children, including not finishing high school, mortality rate, poverty rate, violent crime victimization, suicide, and other kind of moral ills, occurred from 1975 until 1995, with a continued increase in childhood well-being since that period. For example, approximately 35 per 1,000 teenagers aged 15 to 17 in 1975 would have a child, while today that number is at around 12.5. The number of children who were the victims of violent crime began in the 70s around 80 per 1,000, peaking in the early 90s at around 120 per 1,000, and now down to a value of 50 per 1,000. So things weren't comically grim in the 70s, I mean, people did make it through the 70s relatively unscathed, but it was still a much more dangerous time than being a kid today, although evidently not as dangerous as it was during the 90s. Another aspect of the 70s that began to breed the satanic panic were two interesting but interrelated, at least in my estimation, social changes. First, we had the rise of cults in the 60s and their eventual disastrous ends in the early 70s. Jonestown, the Manson family, and many others would have their time in the spotlight during this decade, leading to deaths, destruction, and broken families across the country, and in some cases across the world. Interestingly though, alongside cults came a further focus on psychology in the popular mind, with people looking for methods to reprogram or fix their family members who had fallen into a cult sway, as well as attempting to find ways to fight the allure of cults in general. This began an era of self-psychology or pop psychology, with people believing that they could read self-help books, attend seminars, or even become experts in complicated psychological methods and practices from the comforts of their own homes. This bred both the anti-cult movement, which felt that cult programming and psychological control were means to cause humans to become immoral or even to become influenced by satanic ideas, as well as an era where the regression of memories under hypnosis became a popularly accepted practice before true scientific studies could be performed. We talked about hypnotic regression of memories in the last episode, but it's an essential part of the satanic panic story as well, since the vast majority of evidence provided to back up these claims were obtained from hypnotic regressions, at least from the adults. But there's also the related idea of brainwashing, the ability to cause someone to forget a memory or event through psychological tricks. This would very much play into the satanic panic, and become a really foundational part of the overall mythos. You can add to that the stories from MKUltra and other kind of government control tests and things like that, and we really have a stew where this idea that you could brainwash someone into doing something is very, very strong. And finally, we have the rise of the evangelical Christian movement in the United States. The U.S. has always gone through periods of religious downturn and revival. In the late 70s until really today, marks a relatively large and politically important movement for Christians in the United States. But this has also been linked with quite a bit of pseudoscience, unfortunately, including denial in climate change, conspiracy thought generally, and the belief that the devil is a very real and very powerful presence in modern media and politics. And it's from this idea that Satan is real and always watching always attempting to overtake good morals in the United States, using his Judas priests and his gyrating hips and his marijuana, that the satanic panic really gets its power. That stupid, sexy Satan. Anyways, 
As we began getting into the 80s, the public concern about these social ills was really beginning to become openly talked about. We had the start of the war on drugs, increases in the requirements to report suspected child abuse, a widening of the definition of what constituted sexual assault, domestic abuse, and child endangerment and child abuse, all of that leading to more reports of these cases as well as more police involvement. We also had a somewhat larger emphasis on a group of individuals that have been termed the less dead. Those parts of society who, when they go missing or are reported to have been the victim of violence, the vast majority of people sort of ignore or even blame. This is particularly true of the media, and this group includes sex workers, minorities, immigrants, and runaways. And although the phenomenon of the less dead is still particularly bad in the mass media, there have been improvements in how these cases are handled at least by police and social workers, for example. But some of the attempts to fix societal ills were pretty weird. We had attempts to censor music, television, movies, comic books, and even board games such as Dungeons and Dragons. And at the root of these concerns was the idea that they had suggestive, or at times explicit, themes such as sexuality and violence that were turning the kids into violent, sex-crazed monsters. In some areas, these ideas, though, coagulated into a much more strange belief. At church groups, at PTA meetings, and soccer games, parents across the country were talking about the possibility of another, more sinister influence coming in from the mass media. Again, we had church leaders and moral authorities stating that Satan was real, that he was present throughout the media, and that we had to fight his influence. And so the idea that, again, Satan is in the media, Satan is out there, Satanism is being practiced just under our noses, is not that crazy an idea when you have people you look up to and listen to telling you that it's true. So the satanic panic really began due to a confluence of all of these ideas. There was real evidence that the world was a particularly scary place for children, that sexual assault and violence against children was prevalent and that there really were monsters out there sometimes, performing horrible acts in the quiet suburbs and big cities alike. At the same time, there really were cults out there, performing various psychological tricks to cause groups of normal citizens to become murderers, or to engage in wild sexual binges. Bridge that together with the idea that brainwashing could be used to hide memories, or make someone do things against their normal will, and suddenly it's not a far step to suppose that somewhere, out there in the suburbs, may exist a cult-like group using these techniques to get whatever they wanted. All it would really take would be an ember to light this tinderbox up, and that ember would make its way into the public consciousness in the form of a book titled Michelle Remembers. The book posited that Michelle Smith, along with her psychiatrist Lawrence Pazder, had uncovered repressed memories from when she was a child. In these memories, she was a part of a satanic sex cult which had caused her to engage in all sorts of depraved acts of sacrilege, sexual sadism, torture, murder, and dismemberment. Now, there were no real pieces of evidence for these claims outside of the hypnotic regression therapy sessions, but to people who were already willing to believe that something like this might be happening and might be the nice, quick solution to so many social ills that seemed so complicated, it really made sense. From this book, you had a lot of communities where hypnotists or memory regression specialists would set up shop, performing these regressions heavy-handedly and looking in some cases to prove that something was going on in these towns. And you had parents, terrified that this might actually be going on, looking for signs of it in their children and in some cases leading them to answer odd questions about these things. And in some of these cases, the kids, hoping to get out of a strange situation, or just answering leading questions as most children do, would answer in the positive. Add on top of this a number of less-than-moral experts on satanic panic, who claim that the conspiracy went all the way to the very top of the U.S. government, again without a single shred of verified scientific evidence, and you've got the makings for a really screwed-up moral panic. Alright, so we have these people these psychiatrists who are claiming that these kids are coming up to them and saying that they've been sexually assaulted. We have this book that comes out that claims that it's part of a larger sex cult. And we also have people, adults, who under hypnotic regression are claiming that they remember now 
cases where they themselves were involved in similar kinds of sex cults. Now, we can pretty much, I think, relatively easily push away the idea of the repressed memories or the hypnotic regression, right? Um, that's something that has no real good scientific evidence for it. But why were these kids saying that something had happened to them if nothing did? Well, another really important part of this story is the way that the children were interviewed about the supposed sexual assaults. Now, I am no expert in interviewing children, I don't have kids of my own, and the little bit of experience I have with children comes from little cousins and stuff. But in researching for this episode, there have been a couple of interesting points that we've come across. Number one, when interviewing kids, it's what we found now is that it's really important to be open-ended. You don't want to ask the kid anything directly, because a child may feel cornered or pressured to give you an answer in a certain way. So, for instance, if you ask them, you know, do you like mom or dad better? The kid isn't going to answer. But if you say, like, what do you like doing at dad's house? What do you like doing at mom's house? Then they may open up and tell you more about what's going on at a particular home that maybe shouldn't be going on. Another really important point, too, is understanding and evaluating the kid's cognitive abilities, right? Determining, are they prone to fantasy? Are they able to give accurate testimony? Is there something wrong with this child, right? So all of these things are really important. And these are all techniques that we've only really perfected in certainly since the eighties, these aren't techniques that were around for a long time. And so it's important to note that the stage that we were at right now in this time period of the satanic panic, that, that period and the mistakes that were made during the satanic panic have now come to focus and fix our techniques for interviewing children in today's world. So just keep that in the back of your mind. So when interviewing a subject, and especially a child, it's extremely important to not lead them into answers by attempting to not give them any information that may sway their answer one way or the other. So for instance, when listening to a child's testimony, it's important to remain neutral not continuing to question them on points you expect to not be true, or give suggestions that, for instance, that's just not what really happened, is it? And at the same time, you must try to not give them positive reinforcement when they answer with things that you expect or want to be true. It's also important to not give them more information than they normally would. For example, in many cases we could put under the umbrella of the satanic panic, they would question children on sexual assaults, by showing them anatomically correct dolls. Now, as far as I can tell looking at some papers, the use of anatomically correct dolls when used as a tool to show anatomy, to describe events in further detail after they've already been described in an interview setting, and as part of a larger series of discussions of abuse with a child, can be useful. However, the way that children simply play with these dolls is not indicative of anything. And their use without careful control can, at least as far as I can tell again from the data and papers that I've read, lead to at the very least the question of coaching or coercion of a child into giving the information the interviewer expects. Okay, so let's get to the meat of this story here. The really scary stuff, the part that involves very real people being attacked for a very fake moral panic. Let's set the stage again. Michelle Remembers comes out in 1980. There's this upswell of people claiming to be experts in satanic panic and memory regression and being able to sniff out these cases across the U.S. This leads to all kinds of specifically places where kids congregate being thought of as centers for satanic worship and pedophilia and all kinds of other horrible crimes. One part of the satanic panic was its use to investigate and close down daycare centers across the country for claims that these places were hives for pedophiles and evildoers. In the case of Fran and Dan Keller, it would begin with a disturbed child whose parents were going through a very messy divorce, who was acting up at home and at the daycare. This would begin in 1991, and would be the very first of the cases of supposed abuse that had occurred at the daycare center run by the Kellers. And the Keller's small daycare in Austin, Texas, would become the center for one of the most interesting cases of satanic panic, in my opinion. Eventually, it would blossom into multiple accusers, all of whom claimed that the Kellers had been implanting suggestions into their kids' heads to trigger them to perform sexual or satanic actions. 
I'm going to read a quote here from a story titled The Innocent and the Damned from Texas Monthly by Gary Cartwright. Now, although the parents and the girl's name is used in the story, I'm not going to. I'm just going to say that her name is Betsy. So, when Betsy picked up her daughter at Fran's daycare that final time on August 15th, 1991, she had a lot of things on her mind, and one of them was sexual abuse. The 39-year-old University of Houston graduate was in therapy, trying to come to grips with her own memories of being sexually abused by a drunken father who died when she was 18. The therapy had induced new, heretofore unknown recollections of that traumatic time nearly 30 years ago. On top of that, she was struggling through her second divorce. As in the first one, she claimed in legal proceedings that her estranged husband, Billy, had intense and uncontrollable outbursts of rage, that he had physically and emotionally abused their daughter. Billy denied this, but in the five months since the couple's separation, there had been talk of Bad Daddy, which reinforced the image of an abusive father who pulled down the child's panties and beat her with a belt. On the advice of her therapist, Betsy had taken the child to a pediatrician for a vaginal examination on May 7th, one day before she started at Fran's daycare. No signs of sexual abuse were detected, but Betsy was still not convinced that her daughter hadn't been molested. If Betsy was subliminally attempting to transfer her repressed hostility to her daughter, the little girl appeared to be receiving the message loud and clear. More recently, the child's out-of-control behavior included her insistence that she was a dog, walking on all fours, barking, eating out of the dog bowl, defecating or urinating like a dog, licking herself like a dog. Sometimes she defecated or urinated on the floor in front of guests. On one occasion, when Betsy's sister and her boyfriend came for dinner, the little girl took off her clothes, climbed onto the boyfriend's lap, and began kissing him, then relieved herself on the floor. The child had started using profanity too, some of it extremely rough and vulgar. As for the No Limits program recommended by a previous therapist, obviously it wasn't working. Now, clearly this is a very disturbed child, and I hope, I really do hope, that she got the help that she needed after this case ended. I'm not going to go into further gory details here. They are disturbing and gross, and I'm sure if you wanted to find them, you probably could online, but I'm not going to put the listeners that don't want to hear that kind of stuff, I'm not going to put them in the line of fire, so to speak. What eventually happens here with this case is that the child tells her mother that Danny had raped her. This is Dan Keller had raped her, and the mother brings her to a hospital where they find that she has two small tears in her hymen. And to the doctor at the hospital, this suggests physical evidence of sexual abuse. The child would go on further to make other claims about Dan and Fran Keller sexually abusing her and doing all kinds of other horrible things to her. And this kid is really kind of the crux of the story. This child and her mother, really. As the panic spread, parents were told to question their child until they told the truth about the abuse, because children were supposedly told by their captors to lie to other adults or else they would become hurt. And a group called Believe the Children became involved here and helped these interviews along. And I use the word helped with a lot of sarcasm if it wasn't clear in my delivery. This group was created specifically to investigate and promote the idea of satanic ritual abuse. After another famous case, the McMartin Preschool Trial, a topic we will absolutely cover in greater detail in a future episode. During these interviews, the children would claim that the Kellers had forced them to drink blood, have videotaped sex with adults and other children, would force them to kill and dismember children and pets, and that the Kellers had even flown them to Mexico to have sex with adults in that country and return all within the span of a single day at a daycare center. Parents believe the Kellers, along with a network of others, have been using their children to perform these horrendous crimes, create child pornography, and worship Satan. Eventually, this would lead to a coerced confession from a local police officer who was suspected, leading to the Kellers fleeing the state in fear. Because again, at this time, other cases of satanic panic had led to daycares closing and people being run out of their own towns. The final total of accusers was three. Enough, along with the initial accuser's physical evidence, to lead to police involvement and an eventual trial. Now, other children of the daycare claimed that no abuse had occurred, 
And eventually on the stand, one of the main accusers would say that they had been forced to say that the abuse had happened. But the claims of the doctor on the case, again, that one who had seen that initial evidence that he believed was of sexual assault, was enough to lead to convictions for the Kellers. And they were both sentenced to 48 years in prison after a six-day trial. Again, the only physical evidence presented at that trial was from that examination of the initial accuser, who showed what that one doctor believed to be evidence of sexual assault. But, surprisingly enough, three years after the trial, the doctor would find out that in fact the evidence he believed indicated abuse was a common feature among young girls, and therefore was not evidence of wrongdoing or sexual assault at all. On top of that, in later years, the taped interview of one of the accusers would become standard issue in lectures as specific evidence of what not to do in an interview with a child, showing common interviewing mistakes and leading to an unverifiable statement. Even with all of that occurring and everyone agreeing that the satanic panic was ridiculous and there being no evidence, and the doctor saying that, hey, my initial testimony was wrong, it wouldn't be until 2013, a full 21 years after their initial sentence, that the Kellers were released. And this was because of that recanted testimony of the doctor, as well as an eventual reevaluation of the case that again had no remaining physical evidence, a recounted confession, and a witness who on the stand claimed that she had been coerced into giving a false report of abuse. The Kellers would eventually be paid $3.4 million for their lifetime spent in jail. But is that the price you would put on 21 years of your own life? I know I would hope that my time was worth a lot more. This is just one case of the satanic panic creating absolute horrors for those unjustly accused. To date, again, there has been no evidence of satanic ritual abuse uncovered. Although cases of systematic abuse, child porn rings, and even childhood sexual slavery and human trafficking rings have been found in recent years, but to use these as evidence of the truth of the satanic panic is, I think, greatly mistaken. But that leads us to maybe the scariest part of all with this episode on satanic panic. Did we learn anything from these mistakes? Well, in some ways, some good has come out of it in that our ability and our methods of interviewing children have become much better, at least as far as I can tell. At the same time, though, we still do see coerced confessions. I mean, everyone I'm sure has seen Making a Murderer, right? Brendan Dassey seemed to have been obviously coerced. That is a problem. Another point with Satanic Panic that is potentially good is the idea that childhood claims of sexual assault should be taken seriously. However, again, we can see how easy it is for mass hysteria, rather a mass panic, I suppose, to lead to false confessions or false claims. And again, that is why it's so important when we interview children to be really, really good about it, really scientific about it. At the same time, I think another really good thing that we can say at least nowadays as opposed to back then, and this is not 100% all the way around the board, of course, and there's still many cases where this is horrible and it's just, it still happens today. But in general, I would say your chances of making a claim of being sexually assaulted or molested or raped or any other horrible thing happening to you, I think there's a much better chance today that you will be believed by someone in your life and by someone in a position of authority. And if you're not being believed or if something like that has happened to you, I would suggest find an attorney, go talk to the police. And if they don't want to hear about it, find an attorney right? There is someone who wants to hear your story and wants to help you. So I think that might be a, 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 a positive or at least a silver lining on a horrible cloud. But at the same time, we haven't learned all that much, right? The exploitation of people, sexual slavery, human trafficking, all of that still occurs today. And it's occurring maybe at a smaller rate or a lower rate, but it still totally happens. 
right? At the same time, the, the prevalence of moral panics in society, you know, we mentioned that question at the beginning of this episode. Did the satanic panic really go away? I'm not sure it really has, right? We can look at Pizzagate as a perfect example. Pizzagate is just a modern day version of the satanic panic of the 80s and the 90s, right? It's the idea that a secret cabal within the government is creating sex slaves through MK Ultra mind control tricks and talking about it with their friends by using secret silly code words that every one idiot on Reddit can pick apart and figure out. And this idea that that Satan still pervades the media and media is being used to like media is used to change opinion. Media is used to get a point across, right? All of those things are true. However, to, to look for and find evil in everything around you is not only a scary way of looking at the world, but I also think an incorrect one. That's it for this week's episode of the Mad Scientist Podcast. Thank you again so much for listening. My logo was designed by Carrie Shaheen. This week, I have to give a special shout out to our listener, Terry, whose donated sound equipment is making this episode sound phenomenal. So listeners, let's have a big round of applause at our homes or in our cars or at work, I guess. Don't don't clap at work. But, you know, let's have a round of applause for Terry. Thank you so much. I also need to thank all of our other wonderful Patreon subscribers. Without you, this show would not be possible. The stickers, the logos, all the cool research. I bought so many books this month for upcoming episodes. I am so excited. Thank you for supporting the show. In particular, a shout out to our newest patron, David L. McCullough IV, also known as Minkus. Thank you so much for supporting the show, man. And I will see you on Rocket League sometime soon. I also need to give a big shout out to our latest iTunes reviews. Thank you, Crew C91, Whiskey Whale, Me First Please, and Panda2988. Thank you so much for the feedback, and I hope that you still enjoy the show and continue listening. And if you'd like, please send me a message and I will send you some stickers. Once again, thank you so much for listening to the Mad Scientist Podcast, a member of the Dark Myths Collective.